Those who did not produce children were sometimes known as nastria or not female. Women of the third sex were engaged in all means of livelihood, including trade, government, entertainment, as courtesans or prostitutes, and as maidservants. Sometimes they would live as renunciates and follow ascetic vows. Gay men, kleba. The word kleba can refer to any type of impotent man, but in this instance it is specifically used to describe men who are completely impotent with women due to their homosexual nature. Gay men are thoroughly described in the chapter of the Kama Sutra concerning oral sex. Aporish Taka. Oral sex is not recommended for heterosexuals and is forbidden to Brahmins, priests, but it is acknowledged as the natural practice among those of the third sex who are not otherwise engaged in celibacy. Homosexual men who take the passive role in oral sex are specifically known in Sanskrit as Mukibhaga or Asikya. Gay men with feminine qualities are first described. Those with a feminine appearance show it by their dress, speech, laughter, behavior, gentleness, lack of courage, silliness, patience, and modesty. Gay men with feminine qualities are the most recognizable members of the third sex. For this reason, they have often kept their own societies within all cultures of the world. They generally keep long hair and arrange it in berets or in a womanly fashion. Those who dress up as females are known as transvestites. Feminine gay males were often professionally employed by aristocratic women and commonly served within the royal palace. They are proficient in the arts, entertainment, and most notably dancing. As mentioned earlier, their presence at marriage and religious ceremonies was considered to invoke auspiciousness, and their blessings were much sought after. The masculine gay male is next described. Those who, like men but dissimulate the fact, maintain a manly appearance and earn their lively earn their living as barbers or masseurs. The masculine gay male is not as easily recognizable and would often blend into ordinary society, living either independently or within marriage to another man. Some are known to become professional male prostitutes who work as masseurs. The technique of these masseurs is described in much detail, while effeminate Gay men would keep smooth skin, apply makeup, and sometimes don breasts. The masculine gay male would keep bodily hairs, grow mustaches or small beards, and maintain a muscular physique. They would often wear shiny earrings. Gay men were talented in many different ways and were engaged in all means of livelihood. They often served as house attendants to wealthy Vaishyas, merchants, or as chamberlains and ministers to government officials. Such men were renowned for their loyalty and devotion. Sometimes gay men would live as renunciates and develop clairvoyant powers. Those practicing celibacy were often used as pujaris, temple priests. Gay males typically engaged in fraternal or casual love but were sometimes known to marry one another. There are also third-sex citizens sometimes greatly attached to each other and with complete faith in one another who get married, parigraha, together. There were eight different types of marriage, marriage according to the Vedic system, and the homosexual marriage that occurred between gay males or lesbians was classified under the Gandharva or celestial variety. This type of marriage was not recommended for members of the Brahmin community, but often practiced by heterosexual men and women belonging to the other classes. The Gandharva marriage is defined as a union of love and cohabitation, recognized under common law, but without the need of parental consent or religious ceremony. In the Jaya Mangala, 
an important 12th century commentary on the Kama Sutra, it is stated, Citizens with this kind of homosexual inclination who renounced women and can do without them willingly because they love each other get married together bound by a deep and trusting friendship. Transgenders, Shonda. The Sanskrit word Shonda refers to men who behave, behave like women or whose manhood is completely destroyed. The word Shandi similarly applies to women. This can refer to many types of third gender people, but is perhaps most commonly used to describe those with complete transgender identity. Such people do not identify with their physical sex, but instead consider themselves and live in their lives as members of the opposite sex. Male to female transgenders identify and live as women, whereas female to male transgenders identify and live as men. They are also sometimes called transvestites or transsexuals and differ from gay males and lesbians in that they do not usually identify as homosexual and are less common. It is possible that in ancient India, male to female transgenders may have sometimes castrated themselves in order to become feminized. More likely, however, since self-mutilization is greatly discouraged in Vedic culture, men of the third sex who identified as women would have tied their genitals up tightly against the groin with a kopina, a practice that is still common in southern India and also found in various other world cultures. In a similar way, female to male transgenders would have strapped their breasts tightly against their torsos. Nowadays, however, such people often undergo hormone treatment and transsexual operations, especially in the West. Vedic culture allowed transgender people of the third sex to live openly according to their gender identity, and this is demonstrated in the Mahabhar story of Arjuna as Brihanala. Castration was not a common or accepted practice of ancient India, and mutil I'm sorry, mutilation of the body is discouraged in Vedic texts and considered to be in the mode of darkness. Its current illegal practice in northern India among the Hidra or eunuch class can be attributed to the former centuries of Muslim rule <clears throat> that once encouraged the practice among servants and slaves who were homosexual by nature. In South India, largely spared from Islamic rule and influence, there is a third gender class similar to the Hijra known as Jogo Jogapa, but they do not practice castration. The abused Hijra class of modern-day India is the sad result of cruel social policies directed against people of the third sex for almost a thousand years, rejected by foreign overlords who ridiculed and condemned any form of gender-variant behavior as intrinsically evil and unnatural. These citizens were abandoned as social outcasts Homosexual and transgender males could join the Hijra class by castrating themselves but were otherwise forced, forced to marry women and pretend to live as ordinary men. Unfortunately, this stifling social policy still remains dominant in India today and has become accepted by most modern-day Hindus. That is really sick and disgusting and sad. I'm really, really disgusted to, to see how India has transformed into horrible um, living conditions and policies for the third sex. I'm very unhappy with that. Intersex, Napumsa. The word Napumsa can refer to any non-reproductive person of the third sex. Sometimes it specifically implies people born with ambiguous genitalia, the intersexed, such people may be homosexual, heterosexual, or sexually undefined by nature, and their degree of impotence can vary greatly. 
Those born without proper sex organs are called nisarga in Sanskrit and typically have a chronic physical condition caused by the biological combination of the male and female sexes known today as intersexuality. This condition, formerly known as hermaphroditism, leaves its members sexually dysfunctional, unusually formed, or sterile. According to Vedic texts, people are born this way, uh, at least in some instances, due to past sinful activities. Nevertheless, some, nevertheless, such people were respected for their napumsaka status and treated kindly by Vedic society. They were accepted according to their nature and typically lived within the larger third gender community where they shared similar roles. In modern biology, the study of intersexuality and its various conditions is relatively new. The concept of the male and female sexes com combining on a biological level, however, was already known by Vedic science many thousands of years ago and corresponds with the Tritiya Prakriti category. Most modern researchers now suspect that biology, including genetic or inborn hormonal factors, plays a significant role in determining not only a person's physical sex, but also their sexual orientation and gender identity. Indeed, homosexuality and transgender identity may very well be some of the most common forms of intersexuality we know, and this would explain why Sanskrit words describing people of the third sex are often used interchangeably and why homosexuals transgenders, and the intersexed are classified together. It is a commonly held myth among some people that the third sex mentioned in Vedic texts refers only to the physical intersexed and not to homosexuals. While this view is clearly contradicted in the Kama Shastra, it is also important to note that intersex conditions are much less common within nature than homosexuality. On average, chronic intersexuality occurs in approximately one out of every 36,600 births, and transgender identity in about one out of every 3,000. When this figure is compared to the estimated homosexual population of 5%, or one out of every 20 births, it makes only one intersex and 12 gen it makes only one intersex and 12 gen transgender persons for every 1830 gay and lesbians this is how common gays and lesbians are one out of 20 births this disparity clearly demonstrates the predominant role of homosexuals within the third sex category and indeed Sanskrit lists of the third sex clearly include them among the various types cited. Bisexuals, Kami. The Kama Sutra thoroughly describes all types of sexual behavior and practices between heterosexual or first and second gender men and women. This is by far the, ma the major portion of the text Within these chapters, bisexuality is occasionally mentioned. Apparently, in Vedic times, bisexuality was considered to be more of a variation for men and women who were so inclined, and not as a category of the third sex. Because bisexuals engaged in the procreative act, they did not possess the napumsaka nature of the third sex and other sexually neutral people. The Sanskrit word kami indicates that such persons were especially fond of lovemaking and that they displayed this fondness in a variety of ways. Kami includes people who are simultaneously attracted to both men and women or who engage in homosexuality for reasons other than natural attraction. Those who periodically switch back and forth between heterosexuality and homosexuality are sometimes known in Sanskrit as paksha. Bisexual feelings within heterosexual 
or homosexual people usually occur at a rate of about 10 or 15 percent for either group. These feelings may range from very mild ones that are easy to ignore on up to stronger ones that require satisfaction. Bisexuality is a curious nature in that it can move back and forth, thus involving the question of choice, which is normally not an issue with heterosexuals or homosexuals. Heterosexuals often confuse the homosexual nature with bisexuality, falsely considering homosexuality to be merely a choice or tendency. They are unaware that the vast majority of homosexuals, or roughly 90%, have absolutely no attraction, natural or otherwise, for members of the opposite sex. Bisexuals themselves are often uncertain about their own sexuality, especially during adolescence. In one survey, 35% of all bisexual people reported to have previously identified as gay or lesbian earlier in life. So I just want to point out here that, yes, it's very common that misconception. Many, many people who I have spoken to think that homose- homosexuality is merely a choice that they are choosing. They have no idea that this comes from childhood, that it is naturally born within them, that it is not a choice, that it is, it is their nature, their property. They are born with it. In any case, bisexuals were typically accommodated within ordinary heterosexual society, but would frequent the third gender communities where they were similarly welcomed. Topics discussed in the Kama Shastra pertaining to them include men who visit transvestites or masseurs working as prostitutes, men in the company of lesbians, transvestites within the king's harem, women of the harem satisfying themselves in lieu of the king's absence, and male servants who practice homosexuality in their youth but then later become inclined towards women. Bisexual women... Kamini are mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam within the chapter describing heavenly realms situated below the earth. In those beautiful regions within celestial gardens and accompanied by lesbians and nymphs, Pumskali, bisexual women would entice men with a cannabis beverage and enjoy sex to their full satisfaction. Sexual accommodation versus Puritanism. In the Vedic system, different standards of behavior and sexual conduct are prescribed for different classes of men. For example, the priestly order was held to high standards of conduct, followed by the government officials. Merchants and farmers were given more leniency and ordinary workers and artisans who made up more than half of the population were given more leniency still. This contrasts greatly with most modern systems whereby all citizens are expected to follow the same laws. The advantage of the Vedic system is that it is able to accommodate all varieties of men within society according to their different natures. It should be understood that the sexual behaviors described in in the Kama Shastra are intended for the Vedic citizen pursuing worldly enjoyment, which is generally the aim of most people. They are not intended for those engaged in vows, austerities, and other penances that are recommended in the Vedas as a means of attaining moksha, or liberation from material bondage. For this class of men, the spiritualists and Brahmins, only celibacy is prescribed, even within marriage. And this is considered to be the highest standard of conduct for those in the human form of life. However, Vedic culture is all-encompassing and thus, while ultimately encouraging renunciation, also realistically accommodates other standards of behavior among common men. In modern times, laws are drawn which artificially attempt to force all citizens to adopt standards of conduct that are normally assigned to the priestly class. From the Vedic perspective, however, sexual restraint is only effective when it is voluntary. 
Laws were used to regulate vice by establishing de designated areas within the city or town and prohibiting it elsewhere, such as in the Brahmin or temple districts. Responsible family life and celibacy were publicly encouraged and promoted by the government, but at the same time, other forms of sexual behavior were acknowledged and accommodated accordingly. These include a wide variety of activities such as prostitution, polygamy, sexually explicit art, homosexual practices, and keeping of concubines, courtesans, etc. Anyone familiar with Vedic culture will be well aware that these activities were allotted a limited space within its culture. They also continue to flourish even in modern times despite centuries of prohibition. The puritanical concept of total prohibition of vice is a failed, unrealistic system that causes widespread hypocrisy, disrespect for law, and injustice for many citizens. People of the third sex have especially suffered under this system. The Third Sex and Scriptural Law The sage Vatsyayana recognizes that sexual behavior varies from country to country. People of the southern and western regions tend to be more relaxed in their attitudes concerning sexual variation. Adorata, anal intercourse, for instance, is particularly practiced by people in the southern regions while acknowledged as being occasionally practiced by all three sexes. It is not recommended for any of them, including members of the third sex, and is, of course, forbidden to Brahmins. Its practice is said to divert the life heirs downwards and cause disease. Homosexual men who take the passive role in anal sex are specifically known in Sanskrit as kumbhika. Regarding scriptural law, there are no verses in the Dharma Shastra that specifically prohibit sexual behavior among people of the third sex. Two verses admonish sexual intercourse among ordinary males, pumsa, Prakriti, but the atonement set set is a mere ritual bathing and applies only to Brahmins or those of the twice born class. A twice born man who engages in inter intercourse with a male or with a female in a cart drawn by oxen in water or in the daytime shall bathe dressed in his clothes. Another verse states. Striking a Brahmin, smelling obnoxious items such as liquor, cheating, and engaging in intercourse with a male are declared to cause the loss of a caste. This loss of caste was not permanent since it could be atoned for, but it is generally accepted that unmarried Brahmins should always practice celibacy. Even married Brahmins were discouraged from having any sexual contact with their wives unless specifically engaged to produce a child in accordance with the Garbhodana Samskara process. There are similarly no laws in the Dharma Shastra prohibiting sexual acts between women except for two that involve the violation of young unmarried girls aged 8 to 12. In the Artha Shastra, relatively minor fines are given as punishment for homosexual acts committed by twice-born males or involving young unmarried girls. The fines for men are approximately four times the fines for women and girls. It is also interesting to note that heterosexual crimes such as adultery and the pollution of women are punished quite harshly in the Dharma Shastra, usually by corporal punishment or death. In comparison, the same texts take little issue with homosexual behavior and seem to view it as rather harmless. Other topics mentioned in the Dharma Shastra pertain, pertaining to people of the third sex include their excusal from ancestral worship and oblations, strata, their omission from family inheritance unless they had progeny, the recommendation that they, as well as women, should avoid offering food into the sacrificial fire, and that ritualistic priests, smarta brahmins, should not partake of such offerings. Most of these injunctions relate to the fact that people of the third sex did not appease their forefathers and ancestral gods by producing progeny and were therefore treated as ascetics. 
Fire sacrifices and other ritualistic ceremonies are mostly intended for householders and not for renunciates or people of the neutral gender.